I was there, it was 48 degrees on the start line and I had 165k to ride. Goal that day was just not to take heat stroke and not to collapse and die <laughs> type of thing. It's a test anyone can do. They don't need any specialist equipment, just a power meter. Simple terms, it'll tell you your VO2 max, your FTP, all these figures just from a test you can do at home on your turbo or out in the road. Do you give us a bit more about MNT? Had maybe 70 or 80 riders I've looked after in the past and had numerous victories from uh, 4, uh, 3, to, uh, 2, uh, 1, right through to professional. I was at altitude once for two weeks and I came home and won the stage of the Ross. That was the first pro win I ever had and I was flying that week to be honest. Tour of Britain white jersey winner. Fourth Commonwealth Games, sprinting for a medal. How much would I have to train to beat Matty Tiger? Well, um, no chance. So quite a bit, <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the first episode of our brand new series, Inside the Industry. Interviewing some of the most fascinating individuals from all aspects of cycling, these videos will provide you with a special opportunity to get a behind the scenes insight into the industry that very few have access to. Today we're very happy to have one of our sponsored riders and professional cyclists, Matthew Taggart. Thanks very much mate, yeah, this is the first real podcast I've ever done. So it's a bit like the Joe Rogan experience here, it's classic setup. <laughs> yeah, Tom, Tom's a wizard, which, yeah. is, which is quite good. But uh, just to give you a bit of a sort of loose introduction, we'll not go through all of your palmares, but um, just to give a sort of I think, touch on your teams and your background. So on post, which was uh, sort of famous for Sam Ben, I think, sort of he's popped out of that from way yeah. back in the day. Wiggins, Evil Pro, a couple of French teams as well. Uh, we have Sun God um, and then AT85, um, we can talk about that stuff later on. Um, so solid teams, pretty much, I think, from a progression point of view. Yeah, I think five continental teams. I had a bit of a, a blip in the middle where I had a, a bad back and had to get surgery and stuff and had to go back to France as an amateur and work my way back up. But um, yeah, five years as a continental pro, as, yeah. as we talk about. So mm -hmm. yeah, plenty, plenty of experience uh, all around Europe, yeah. really, which is... It's interesting you said that actually because it kind of leads on to the next bit, which mm -hmm. was I was sort of like just going to talk through some of your results just last year. So you think that you come back, you come back from an injury, being off for a couple of years, and then back in the scene again. So just last year, Tour of Britain white jersey winner, and just to sort of emphasize some of the teams that were at it: Enios, Movie Star, uh, DSM, Bora, and then some of the riders: Pidcock, Pollard, Michael Woods, Tunes. Like I mean, some really, really, really high caliber athletes. You won the white jersey. Yeah. Fourth Commonwealth Games, um, and you were sprinting for a medal. Seriously impressive, and some of the names even that were at that: Garrett Thomas, Fred Wright, Darrell Impey, Aaron Gate, who won, Luke Plop, etc. You know, and then Irish national points winner last year. So that's just three bullet points I had there. So I mean, from your comeback, bad back, over a few years, and then to get to that stage, I mean, like you're a pretty good rider. I think it would be fair to say. And you which, blew, blew me up nicely there, I'll I keep did, going. No, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Compliments get you everywhere. So which was my very first question was, how much would I have to train to beat Matty Tiger? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of people, I'll, I'll break it down a wee, but a lot of people would say that I'm very talented, but I personally would say that I have no talent whatsoever because of the amount of work that I've put in over the years. To, to put it in terms of hours, probably, you probably have to average three, three and a half hours a day per day for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's that's what I did to get to last year, to the results I got last year. So, so you're saying there's no chance? So quite a bit, <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> it was starting now, it'll be. <laughs> well, cycling is one of those things, it's one of those sports where um, time beats, beats like intensity every time, if you know what I mean. So um, the more the, the more you can train, the longer your durations. So a 20 hour week will beat a 15 hour week if, if it's at the right intensity or if at lower intensities. So um, generally that's what the big pros do. Everyone knows the big pros are just on the bike for five, six hours a day. So yeah, being full time, that's what I've done for the last nine years, averaging 20, 25 hours a week, every week. So um, yeah, that's that's pretty much yeah. what it would take. I think that you're probably underestimating yourself a good bit there because like some of those names I mentioned that you're competing against and some of the results don't wouldn't equate to just, oh, I have, I don't have talent. I mean, obviously there's, there's something in there. I mean, how, what do you have to do to beat those guys? I mean, so you're obviously, you've raced against like the Tour de France riders. Mm -hmm. You're obviously, you've, you're doing something right to get an edge over them or to finish ahead of them. I mean, it's not it's not just luck. You know, what, what would you say is your, your biggest 
your biggest sort of feature in, the, in that respect? How do you how do you beat those guys whenever you're racing? So think about Commonwealth Games or um, you know Tour of Britain. Like what are you doing right that they're maybe not doing right, or you're catching them unawares, or what's happening? Well, I think in terms of training, everyone's sort of on a level playing field now. The science and the uh, the technology and all sort of caught up over the last ten years, and everyone knows um has good coaches now and knows what's a good training plan what what's a bad training plan that nutrition as well everyone's sort of on quite a level playing field well most of the full-time pros would be anyway um and the only really thing that it comes down to i think in in races and race situation to getting over that line first is really your tactics and a bit of luck on the day um yeah it just depends on on how you play it usually the the strongest man or the man with the best legs is not the man who wins it's the smartest man who wins as such we as we say in cycling um so it's not always having the best legs and being the best that crosses the line first it's sometimes just having that wee bit of luck um things things going right for you and even having those bigger names looking at each other behind and the group behind if you know what i mean and you can slip off up the road um so that wee bit of luck but also i think there is an aspect of talent and just your general physiology like as i was saying there like i i, I that wasn't me um trying to make a joke there i genuinely think i'm i'm not that talented because of the work i know the work that i've put in over the years and when you see some of these other pros like remco who three years ago had only picked up a bike if you know what i mean i know he hasn't put in the work on the train that I have, but yet he he is so beyond everyone else in the world. So there is an aspect of your physiology. Like people naturally will have um bigger, stronger hearts, bigger lungs, better lung capacity, so naturally higher VO2 max, that sort of stuff. So um it's one of those sports too where it's just it's a mix of luck, physiology, the training you've done. There's so much that goes into it and that's one of the things I love about cycling. It's like, it's every day there's so many variables. You show up to the start line on the race, there's 200 guys, 200 kilometers. There's the 10 years previous of work that you've put in, but on that day, like you've no idea what what's gonna happen like. Um, it could all blow up in your face within within 10K or or you could you could win by 10 minutes on that day. You know what I mean? It's, you've no idea. Whereas compared to like say running or something, um, you just know, for example, like Usain Bolt, if he shows up, oh, he's capable of running a, a nine second, um, hundred meters. Whereas I'm only capable of running eleven seconds. So if he's on his day, he's gonna win every time. Whereas cycling, there's so many variables in that. Mm-hmm. It makes it a lot, lot more interesting. I think. Yeah. See, um, I'm a reading a couple of years ago. It was all to do with um bigger teams and like the much money and sponsorship to get. And there was yeah. kind of this whole story which was around, you know, is it a level playing field because Umbo and and he also were all like using ketones and all this stuff, which gives you like energy boost at no tail end races and stuff. Mm-hmm. Do, is it a level playing field? I mean, whenever you race against those guys, is it level? Is it sort of seen as that? Or is it seen that, you know, those guys show up and you know they're kind of they've maybe got 3% on you because their funding allows them to buy all of the stuff that you need to be at the optimal level? Yeah. Is that the case? I think so. Um, the, it's more so budget. It's not so, so much what you're saying there. Like, even ketones and all these like supplements or whatever it may be or nutrition stuff that's so so minimal i think at the highest level uh but the big difference is for example like altitude camps i was going to say that's one of the questions actually you know where where you can live where you can base yourself do you have a constant masseuse following you around every day do you have a chef that follows you around every day like these guys do these biggest teams they have a team chef they have swan yours who are really just like personal assistance so even like at Ineos for example when those guys go home to Colombia there's three or four staff go home with them and yet it's their job just to follow them around and, and attend to their every need whereas like also at a lower level the teams don't have the budgets to pay them people pay them staff to come and do that like that's that is their job is just to to cater for whatever Egan Bernal needs for example whereas at our level it's most definitely that like you will show up to the race and you'll get catered for on that day but away from that you're left to your own devices and you have to come home from training and cook your own dinner just eat all the um, free food when you're gone <laughs> exactly in your pockets exactly so you have to look after yourself in that aspect so you're it's more so like the recovery and um, you're not getting the adequate recovery um again that's a, a lot the mistake that a lot of people make is they don't realize training makes you worse it's the recovery that that then makes you better 
Like if I sent you out for a three hour ride now, you would come home. I wouldn't come a home. Worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, if you come home, you would come home a worse cyclist than I sent you out. Because if I told you to wait 10 minutes and go do the same thing again, you wouldn't be capable of doing it at the same level or same rate. You know what I mean? So you're you're less fit and more fatigued and you've done damage to your body. So it's the recovery then that makes you better. So these big pros, the recovery is just next level compared to all of us. Time-wise, same sort of hours, you reckon? Those guys still doing sort of 20, 25 hours and around that more? Again, because of the increased recovery that they have, they have a wee bit more time than to train. But yeah, it, they're not really doing any more than 30 hours. A 30-hour week, even for a World Tour Pro, is, a, is quite a big week. Um, so they're not doing... They're not doing massive, massive, lead different uh, training, training yeah. volumes. Interesting. The um, sorry, you touched on it there, which was altitude training. Mm-hmm. Do you ever do altitude training? And does it does it make much difference? Have you have done it? I was at altitude once for two weeks, and I came home on one stage of the Ross. That was the first pro I ever had, and I was flying that week. To be honest, um, to me it definitely works, definitely. But that was with Ampost. That I was with Ampost. That was a while ago then. Yeah. yeah. With Kurt mm-hmm. Bogart's team, that would have been 2015 or 16, maybe. I can't even remember. Um, and the reason I was there is I broke my elbow in Liege, Bast on Liege, the under 23 version. I crashed and broke my elbow. Um, so I was down and out for a few weeks, could only ride the turbo. So Kurt flew me to altitude. Um, we had a great budget with Ampost, and Kurt was, was really, really good. Um, with Ampost is such a real, well-run team for, for limited budget if you know what I mean so me and three other guys went to altitude for just over two weeks and I sat in the turbo for the first week just tiddling along and the second week just did quite big hours volume nothing intense came home first race day like five days later was stage one of the RAS and I was a wee bit ropey that day and then stage two felt unreal and stage three was the stage of one then took yellow jersey and probably should have won the won the race overall. Um, it didn't in the end just because of tactics and the way it, the way it play, played out. We had a, we had a teammate go up the road and then, um, so he took over the overall lead, which was good for us and me as a team. But then he lost it, um, a few days later. You think but, altitude did make the, the difference? Altitude made yeah. all the difference to me. Like yeah. definitely, hundred percent. Never measured it, no. Out of curiosity, um, it's it's hard to measure. It is. Mm. Would you see it, see it through your FTP, no, or anything like that, or is it more of a physiological feeling? You would, you would see it would through you? your FTP, probably. Mm. But to be honest, everyone's caught up in this FTP. I know it's kind of. I say yeah. that look term generically because yeah, I was my day. It was always FTP, where it's now not that. So no, your ability to sprint, yeah, ten second efforts, exactly. Racing's like not FTP. It's like on and off, isn't no, it? No, so, but it is a good. It is a good like base value for. To work out your training zones and all that sort of stuff but we would rarely t- test that often if you know what i mean um it's such even a psychological thing to go and do a 20 minute all out ftp test it's it's quite taxing mentally more than anything so we would rarely test and we're always comparing our numbers and heart rates and all that there to, to work out our ftp if you know what i mean without actually going out and doing the test so um in that in that aspect i haven't f- uh, physically measured it but i know that was that de- that was definitely the altitude um, just to increase the oxygen, it's it's uh, it, it's it just means it's, it's like yeah, it's technically like legal sort of doping because that's what EPO is, isn't it? It's yeah, just that's true. You're just more trying red blood to cells in your body. Your red blood cells so in, yeah. like yeah, for people that don't know what happens, it's like reduce your oxygen availability mm-hmm. to your lungs. Yeah, and then your body produces more red blood cells, which exactly. I don't know what the percentage is after a period of time, but don't your know. more red blood cells. And if you come away from altitude, mm-hmm. remain there for whatever yeah. couple of weeks isn't until your blood recycles. Uh-huh. So you've got a boost then, really, isn't it? But no, that's exactly what EPO does the same, doesn't it? It's Definitely, like, yeah. That's what they were doing back in uh-huh. Armstrong's days and so on. Yeah. Inject EPO in, boost your red blood cells and so on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we should get you whenever you retire we'll do a test and see what see what it was Send me an altitude we'll, for a few we'll review back on this and be like it was 15 percent. it was massive <laughs> yeah maybe not um you were saying there about evan the pole um mm-hmm. cause I know we sort of loosely talked about sort of t- training and programming and stuff before but inside testing something you're sort of you, you're sort of keen on aren't you and it's like that's how i'm, I'm not sure am i right in saying evan the pole was sort of discovered through inside testing i'm not sure sort of it, like give us sort of physiology and all yeah you, you tell us a bit more about that i'm not sure if it was through inside testing specifically that ramco was discovered but a similar sort of basically what inside testing is it's a test anyone can do at home 
um, out in the roads with their own bike own equipment they don't need any specialist equipment just a power meter um, and it will give you the results of a lab like the same scientific results that if you went to like a real specialist um, lab sort of you know for, for here like Sport Ireland or or Sport NI what they would do what they would provide which you'll pay thousands of pounds for so this inside it, it's a very advanced software and it computes and works out exactly all the all this data and all these figures just from a test you can do at home on your turbo or out in the road just with a power meter one test um yeah it's just mm. just a one-off test so basically it works out all of your physiological parameters but also your metabolic parameters too so in simple terms it'll tell you your vo2 max your ftp but also like how many grams of carbohydrate per hour your body is is using so how much you'll need to refuel um, where your fat max is what they talk about so the most that's the most optimal or the e most easily sustained level of prolonged endurance activity as such so you can work out exactly where that is and then be able to bump that up so if you're an inefficient rider you struggle with endurance you can tell it exactly what watts you can you can boost that if you know what i mean or bump that up by so training you, specifically at that so you're saying is that utilizing fat more than exactly so training your body to mm -hmm. stay in those fat burning zones so you use yeah, fats obviously more energy than carbon exactly so if you mm -hmm. go to a lab they'll do all this through a mask and they'll measure your inhalation and expiration and the gases the gas exchange and stuff to work all this out um and then they'll take your your blood and your your measure of lactic lactic acid in your blood to work out all your power zones but this doesn't need to do any of that you just go out and do a few power tests on the road and it and it tells you exactly what it is um it seems like hard to believe but it it seems to compare it to it to a lab test it's 100 percent accurate so it's it's even it's field field too as well uh -huh. it's pretty accurate yeah yeah so um it just gives you like every every sort of data point you could think about or you would ever want or need um for for cycling or for endurance performance it's it's all there in front of you so you can see exactly like where you're strengthening weaknesses lay what you need to improve on and, and it'll also compare it to to the average if you know what i mean to the average of a third cat rider um a sort of intermediate level rider onto professionals you can compare all that as well so and see exactly where you lay interesting i mean training obviously has evolved mm -hmm. over quite a long time whenever i was just in 10 plus years ago mm -hmm. and as far as i back probably like i say ftp was kind of the benchmark and you get all your zones from it and now it's yeah. like it's nothing like that yeah you know FTP is probably, unless you're a time trial, it's not really that relevant, but those spikes, the 10 second, 30 second, one minute, five minute efforts and so on is kind of like the bigger thing. Yeah, definitely. You've been, I don't know if you've been a professional cyclist for? Uh, quite, about seven years now. Yeah. So what do you think? What's the reason you think that people people feel, professional cyclists feel, upcoming riders coming through the system? Because I'm sure you've probably seen it first time when you see the next... I know even like I obviously follow it here locally and sort of across you, you can yeah. Ireland and you, you hear these emerging talents and then they, they, they disappear after two or three years and they're gone. Yeah. I mean, what would you say is the reason people fail in cycling for guys that want to make it? Um, I think for young people, I think one of the main reasons is that they get too heavily involved too early on the, the, the sort of dive in the deep end and haven't learned how to swim yet as such. All of this information is out here on how to train, how to eat, how to be like the perfect athlete and if you do that too young and just dive in head first usually they all break down mentally and they can't they can't it's not sustainable um for a young person it takes it does take years and years of your body adapting to all this if you know what i mean so if you just try and dive in the deep end and because as i say all the information is there it's out there if you look it up like you can find through insight and and through like all the academic journals and stuff exactly what the pros are doing and what makes them so good so you can train to be at that level um if you want but it's it takes years and years of your body adapting to all this for it to overcome so i think a lot of a lot of younger up-and-coming athletes the they break down mentally and they can't hack it and they end up giving up it's uh it's just yeah it's it's not a a nice or glamorous lifestyle it, the amount of sacrifice and dedication 
attacks, it's it's different than any other any other sport. I think that, like, I mean, I know what you're right. I mean, if you see behind the scenes of a professional cyclist, like, it's a lot of effort goes in the background. Yeah. But I think that we were, we were sort of chatting recently about um, some of the events you've been to, and I remember you were saying about I thought it was really interesting, like going to Qatar yeah. for the world was World Championships. World Championships. Mm-hmm. And do you want to tell us about some of the weird experiences in Qatar, like about the water? and stuff we were saying yeah we were saying it was because it, it was so hot wasn't it? it was like 40 degrees or something like i mean i think like, if you're professionals like us you get exposed to stuff you wouldn't normally get exactly but, i mean some of the stories like are incredible so i think in the yeah. sort of flip side of that so you get to go to really cool places and you get these weird experiences in life yeah well uh, qatar was a good example I think. no definitely you get the experience and travel all these far and weird and wild places and you think oh that's cool but yeah you're in qatar i went to qatar ultimately to to ride a bike i didn't get to go and look around me and explore and do the touristy stuff i was there it was 48 degrees on the start line and i had 165k to ride um so the the sort of goal that day was just not to take heat stroke and not to collapse and die <laughs> type of thing if you know what i mean while while trying to finish this race also world championships obviously it's, it doesn't get any bigger so um so that was a weird one yeah i was telling you there was a there was um, fire engines with hoses every 6k along the circuit to, to spray water over us and cool us down. Um, and still, I'd say 15, 20 guys collapsed with heat stroke. Um, there was air-conditioned tents and stuff in around the start and finish zone. It was it was mad and you got um, handed up ice, we like ice sock, we stocking really, with a load of ice in it for your put down your back every every couple of kilometers as well. So. Um, yeah, it's, you think, oh, I'm going to Qatar for the World Challenge. That's brilliant. But you're literally there and you're like, okay, I don't want to die with heat stroke now. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's it. probably one of those weird people. I, I think that's a class experience. Yeah. I think just seeing all those, like, even the, like, that behind the scenes stuff to me would be amazing. You know, right. like, just not many people sort of get to see that stuff. No, it's... Which I think is probably the cool thing about cycling sometimes. It's like, those are, like, really good experiences. 100%, yeah, definitely. It was it was definitely cool. Uh, it, was, it was one of the more enjoyable ones as well. But... Like I'm, I'm extremely grateful to cycling for the amount of world the of the world I've seen and the places I've travelled for a 27 year old. It is um quite incredible. Like, but at the same time, you are there to do a job if you know what I mean, and you're not there to be a tourist and look around you. You try and take it in as much as you can, but at the same time, like I've you know I've been to travel to Japan, Qatar, and all these these cool places, but didn't get much time to actually go and look around me if you know what i mean so uh it's it, it seems glamorous from the outside and there is don't get me wrong there's some really really good times and some class memories and class experiences but at the same time there's a, a lot of suffering and hard work and dedication uh that that goes on behind the scenes too that most people don't see you only post on instagram the the nice pictures and the cool bits they don't see you you know, with the covered in road rash and sitting in the shark crying and, and lying on the side of the road after doing your efforts with heat stroke. And even if when it's snowing back home here in the winter and having to go out and do six hours, like, yeah, and you're, you're just holding back tears because you can't feel your hands the whole way around. It's a rally over though, isn't it? It is. The sort of, what would you do differently? I mean, if you had to go back to whenever Maddie was a, a 12 or 13, 14 year old, would you do the same thing or would you do anything different with um, cycling and training? The one thing I would do different is I would get off road. I didn't do much off road as a as a young rider. I started quite late, well, quite late in cycling terms in that first year junior, really. And um, a lot of people are on the bikes from under 12, under 14, 16 or whatever. But I started as a junior. And I think one of the things that let me down and the reason I had so many crashes and so many setbacks through injury was because I probably lacked some bike handling skills of some of the rest of the guys, which which like at home here and in the UK, you don't really notice, but when you're trying to descend the Alps at 80 k an hour, then you notice it, then it's scary. And I, I'm sort of terrified coming down those hills in those races where you can see someone who's just a natural, like those off-road riders now, like Pidcock, Van Der Poel, Van Aert. That's it's, almost, it's almost like a, it's like a weapon to have in part exactly. of your arsenal, isn't it? If you can descend fast and corner fast and comfortably, it's just you're just putting 10 bike lengths into someone exactly straight away on a corner and you're for free mm-hmm. for no effort i know and even just getting yourself out of trouble like if a crash happens in front of you and the only way to go is left towards the curb but you can't bunny hop a curb then you're you're coming down whereas someone like pedcock vanderpool they just flick left bunny hop the curb and it's like it, it never happened they just we whip as well yeah exactly air. we tail it <laughs> yeah show up we show up in the way past but 
that's one thing I would change is definitely do a wee bit more off road and and acquire the sort of skills that'll that would help me then down the line. Mm. When you say uh, off road, you mean cyclocross or cross yeah. country or both or cyclocross and cross country bit of mountain bike just just general sort of skills work i was a wee bit more too focused on i need to put in the hours here i need to put in you know the correct training and the, and the correct zones and all that but you can sort of catch up on that a wee bit later if you know what i mean um you want to be out even just like i can't do a wheelie for example i can't do a pedal wheelie and i'm i've been a professional cyclist for seven or eight years you know what I mean? stuff like that where as a child then i wish i was out bunny hopping curves and doing wheelies and all that all that sort of stuff because I think that would have helped me down the line. Yeah, interesting. Um, <clears throat> sort of a bit of a controversial question here, but it's just an sort of open question, because I'm always curious about this stuff. Yeah. What pisses you off about cycling? So if you ask me that question, I ask myself this sometimes. I've got a list. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, list. yeah. What pisses you off about cycling? Um, what would it, what annoys you? You know when you say cycling or things that annoy you about cycling, what what are they? Well, I think... I obviously love cycling and cycling has been a big part of my life and all but when you mention that you're a cyclist to others and this sort of stigma minor, yeah. and mm-hmm. culture around cycling cyclists are the enemy aren't they? They're like oh you're them you're them idiots who hold up the road and whatever and don't pay your road tax and all this here carry on so that, People forget a lot of cyclists drive cars as well Yeah exactly I have a car yeah. I pay tax No exactly But I cycle on my bike as well Exactly I, I yeah. came here in a car I didn't cycle here so that sort of culture and stigma around it but also the not that it's impractical but for example my brother is a professional footballer and he trains like three times a week or whatever but it's only like an hour hour and a half to be a decent cyclist it just it takes like three four hours so it just totally ruins your weekends for example you've no sort of it's hard to have a social life and be a cyclist if you know what i mean so that's one of the sort of downsides. Sometimes I, I for example, would be watching the football on TV and be like, oh, that, that would be a lot easier, you know what I mean? And could go down the pub after and have a few drinks yeah. or whatever. Whereas in like cycling, a, you can't do that. Seven and a half hour week and that's it. Exactly. Yeah, job done. Exactly. Whereas if you have a, as a pro cyclist, for example, if you have a 20 hour week, they're like, huh, that was an easy week this week, you know what I mean? And you've no time for anything else then. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's a UK or Ireland thing. But getting kids into the cycling is really, really tough. I kind of fell into the accident because my neighbor was a guy who was, was a guy called Morris Foster. He was like a legend yeah. back in the day. He was my neighbor. So yeah. I only got into cycling because I ended up going to races with him and loved it, got the buzz from it. Where yeah. now, when these, is, is there ever any cycling in schools? No, like yeah. it's, I just fell into it by accident. Mm-hmm. I know your family's, your sort of cycling based on it your dad yeah, well, and uncle and stuff i was the same it was a sort of a generational thing in our family both sides of my family were all cyclists but as you said like no one grows up wanting to be a pro cyclist they all want to be footballers or rugby players or whatever you know what i mean cycling is just not popular mm-hmm. was um, it you and i were talking about the australian model as well was it yeah you were saying would you want to tell us about how it well, I know in could, new zealand because i have a few mates in new zealand but they for example in in school as when you're young uh, they have cycling teams and the teams go and race against each other and all on wee short circuits and so it's good for development and stuff but it's also then you become popular if you know what I mean oh I want to be in the school cycling team because you get away on trips and you get a uh, you know skip school and all the rest for the day so it's it becomes like a real incentive and a real sort of a real good thing to be to be a cyclist at a young age and that's why they produce some of the world's best like yeah so that's clearly like that's what we're missing like mm-hmm. i don't know if that exists in ireland at all or across yeah. the uk you know because that is like you know when right first race i went to there was just so much energy show up to a road race as a kid yeah. 12 13 year old and it was just hustle and bustle and whistles mm-hmm. going and it was just like as a kid you're just like mesmerized by it and yeah. it, you're just hooked straight away like i want to be a cyclist oh, yeah. and you see the race and see the competition and the camaraderie and all that and you're just absolutely hooked on it you know and yeah. it's just for me it's you know sometimes it's kind of disappointing sometimes when you don't see that or it doesn't happen it's you uh-huh. know because you said we had that model here how much difference would that make definitely. you know the kids coming through the system you know night and day yeah definitely who knows but uh what well, one of the questions Harry, i don't know if you can sort of talk about it Matty, in any detail but it was one of the questions was what are you doing this year from a from a race perspective um like I say, I know it's sort of recently you've sort of your career's yeah, developed well, and you're you're sort of going the right way. It's kind of everything's sort of going positive. Yeah, well, you, obviously this year I started with AT85 Pro Cycling, which was with Sun God last year. Previously with Sun God, same team, just new sponsors. But um, just in the in the last week, we've been informed that the team's folding. 
they've went bankrupt. No money. The big sponsors have pulled out. So this week I'm sort of in, in limbo as such. We don't really know as writers what's happening. We're going to have to try and find another team or I'm going to have to try and find another team. Same as all of my teammates. Um, so we're all sort of a wee bit in the dark and don't really know what to do, whether we wait it out and see what happens or do we go in, in search of more teams. So in the next sort of week, I'll I'll have a better idea. But at the minute, no, I'm sort of unsure and in limbo. I'm, I'm going to have to find a find a new team now as such which is is quite difficult at this stage of the season that's sort of normal for october november time but not in not in I March. Mean, the April. season sort of has started hasn't it exactly. well, just sort of getting going yeah exactly. exactly so it will be difficult but um who knows i'm hopeful from my results last year that i should be able to find something and um yeah sort of keep my hand in it anyway hope fingers crossed something comes it comes up and comes across the line so sort of like just closing matty um you know, can you tell us a bit more? I know you do a bit of coaching on the side and you're, you were involved with sort of Cycling Ireland and sort of coaching level and stuff. You're doing your master's. Is it, you're yep. still doing it? Is it finished in sports and exercise science? It's uh, in sports coaching and performance. Yeah. I'm doing a master's at University of Ulster here, yeah. Yeah, no worries. Do you want to tell us a bit more about MNT coaching? So, uh, like I say, you do a bit of stuff on the side for people that want to progress and become better cyclists. Um, so you give us a bit more about MNT That'd be good yeah definitely that. obviously yeah. like i was saying my family have a big traditional or a big family tradition is all in around cycling and my grandfather and father have always been coaches as such or coached on the side so then through covid i started to do quite a lot or just before covid with dad and with the local cycling club and stuff and then seen a business opportunity out of it so started up mnt coaching um so I've started that, yeah, so last sort of four years and been doing it on the side with, as well as being a professional cyclist, if you know what I mean. But recently I've been taking a step to sort of try and progress that and look at the longevity and trying to sort of have a backup after my years as a professional cyclist once I retire, then to, to be able to be a full-time coach and sort of help out. So um, it's going going really well, actually, so far. I've, I've had maybe 70 or 80 riders I've looked after in the past and had numerous victories all over ireland from uh four f three to uh, two uh, one right through to professional and had irish national champions champions and stuff so it's uh it's definitely going well and it's something that i like to would try try to give back if you know what i mean so all that sort of knowledge and experience i've acquired um it's weird that a lot of people go to university first and get all the sort of academic stuff and then go and look for experience whereas i feel i've got the opposite i've got all the experience and the knowledge from from being a pro and being coached from the best guys in the world and training with the best guys in the world day in day out um, and actually just living it and, and experimenting on myself really um, all these new intervals and training methods and nutrition methods all of that stuff uh, so now i'm going back to university and getting the academic side as well so i feel like um, i can definitely give a lot back if you know what i mean to the local cycling community and to anyone really who wants to to progress and improve become a better cyclist so it's definitely uh gonna be a big part of my life going going forward now mnt coaching yeah definitely <clears throat> we'll put the link to your uh website um in the and the footnotes here of the, the the video uh but just can't re-emphasize enough that you know you're i know you say you're not talented but clearly you're very <laughs> talented and you do know your stuff um so yeah for people that want coaches or want to check some of that stuff out obviously check maddie's maddie's uh web page out um my that's all the questions i have for this time when we do another one in the future whenever you do this altitude camp yeah, come back and we'll work out what the what the difference was but thank you very much for coming in and having a chat with us as always you know pleasure like you're a gentleman sort of thing sort of out of cycling and in cycling too many of you're racing on that and you know again thank you for sharing your experience oh, thanks very much alan appreciate it and i'm very proud to be the first first uh podcast with scribe cycling all right that's, that's good. good thank you mate. no worries thank you mate